Today's video, I thought I would take some time out to do a primer on weak forms versus strong forms. This is a term I've just mentioned in passing until now, but as we move on to dealing with approximate methods, it becomes important to understand the structure of the governing equations or of the functional in terms of its mathematical form. What I thought I would do is revisit the cantilevered beam problem, where we have it cantilevered at the root and free at the tip, and to that beam, we'll apply some distributed load. We'll call it F over the length of the beam, F of X. And let's set up some coordinates. We have the X direction and the Z direction. And the coordinate in that direction we'll call W. W is the displacement in the transverse direction. So we have our known geometric boundary conditions, which are the two at the root. At X equals zero, we know that the displacement, W of zero, is equal to the slope w comma x of zero and both are equal to zero. Let me remind you that in this case we're just going to examine the static problem. We do this in an attempt just to keep the mathematics a little more simple and then we'll move on to showing how to incorporate the dynamic problem. So the way we derive the governing equations for a static problem is we use the principle of minimum potential energy. The principle of minimum potential energy can be stated as delta pi equals zero where delta is the variation of the potential energy pi, and pi can be written as u minus we, which is the strain energy of the beam minus the work of the external loads. And this can be rewritten as, and I'm going to go through it quickly now, there are other videos where I've explained this, the strain energy of a beam is the integral from 0 to L of 1 half EIW comma XX squared DX, work of the external loads. And I remind you the rule of thumb is that because F and W are in the same direction, therefore the work of the external loads is positive. Since we subtract it, we have a negative sign and negative integral from zero to L of the distributed load F times the displacement W dx. And then taking the variation, I can write this as delta pi is equal to the integral from zero to L E i and then this becomes 2 w comma x x del w comma x x. The two cancels the half, and I'm left with e i w comma x x del w comma x x dx minus the integral from zero to l of f del w dx, and this is equal to zero. Let's give these some numbers: one, two, three, and four. And I've shown in previous videos how this expression for delta pi can further be simplified using integration by parts. We'll do it again here just to provide you with another example of it because I know sometimes some of you panic a little bit when you see this integration by parts stuff and you might be less than comfortable. We're going to sort that out now. So turning the page, I'm going to copy equation 3 over. The idea now is I have this in its weak form. I need to integrate this by parts twice to get rid of the x derivatives. In this case, it's a second order x derivative, so I'm going to need to integrate by parts twice. In the case of the virtual work term, there is no derivative, so I don't need to treat that term at all. So what I'm going to do now amounts to integrating by parts this blue term twice. And the way we do that is we take our integrand and we produce a boundary term where we remove the derivative from the one component. That gives us e i w comma x x del w comma x i've removed one of the x's and this is a boundary term so it's applied at zero and l and then according to the integration by parts method we have to subtract the integral from zero to l and now we apply the derivative to this first part so e i w comma x x we take the derivative of that comma x del w comma x dx and then we just subtract our external virtual work term, exactly as is. So what have we done? We have, in effect, shifted one of these derivatives off of the del w and onto the e i w comma x x. Now we want to do this procedure one more term, just to this term here. This term here we need to integrate by parts in order to get rid of this x derivative. So this is equal to, I just repeat the first term exactly, e i w comma x x del w comma x at zero and l 
minus, because of this minus sign, minus, again, we want to remove an x from this function. So we've got minus e i w comma x x comma x, just this exactly as is, times del w, because we've removed one of the derivatives. And that's applied again at 0 and L. Those are boundary terms. Now we get a plus sign, because this negative of a negative sign flips and gives us a plus sign. We end up with the integral from 0 to L. We just want this part as is. The integral from 0 to L of e i w comma x x comma x, and now take another derivative of that, times del w dx. And that's it. We just need to subtract the virtual work term minus the integral from 0 to L of f del w dx, and we're done. Now that wasn't so difficult, was it? Let me remind you that these are the boundary conditions. This is from where the boundary conditions come. Let's just put a couple of arrows. And these boundary conditions go to zero independently of the expressions under the integral sign. And it's beyond the scope of this video to prove that, but you can take my word for it, that each of the boundary conditions have to go to zero on their own, and separately and independently, so does everything under the integral sign. Okay, so simplifying it another step, we can write the variation del pi is equal to the integral from zero to L, and I'm gonna collect the terms now under the integral sign. I'm gonna collect those together. It's the integral from zero to L of e i w comma x x comma x x minus f del w dx plus, and we'll separate the boundary terms one by one, e i w comma x x del w comma x at x equals L minus the condition here at x equals zero minus e i w comma x x del w comma x at x equals zero. We know that del w comma x is zero because it's a geometric boundary condition, so there is no variation. We've discussed this numerous times in previous videos. Minus, and then we'll deal with the second boundary condition, e i w comma x x comma x del w at x equals l plus e i w comma x x comma x del w at x equals zero. And again, this is equal to zero because the displacement, it's a cantilevered beam, so the displacement is zero at the root at x equals zero. Therefore, the variation is equal to zero. It's a geometric boundary condition. And all of this is equal to zero. Let's give them some numbers. This equation at the top is number three from the previous page. And I think, yeah, I used number four already. So the next one will be number five, number six, and this last one will be number seven. And so as a result of the remaining terms going to zero independently, as I've stated, is that the governing equation can be written as e i w comma x x comma x x minus zero. Then the remaining boundary conditions at the tip, which are the natural boundary conditions, the tip is a free edge, so at x equals l, the conditions are e i w comma x x comma x is zero and also w comma x, x is equal to zero. This is simply a result of what we showed on the previous page where e i w comma x, x at l must be zero and e i w comma x, x comma x is equal to zero. And then separately, this is equal to zero. So that's all I've stated here. Should be no confusion. Let's put some red boxes around it because these are final results. Let's just put a note here that this is the governing equation and these two natural boundary conditions which amount to the free edge conditions are that the shear is zero at the tip and also the moment is zero at the tip. And we'll number these eight and nine. But what I would like to do is look at the different forms of the governing equation that we saw, namely this form here, this sort of intermediate form of it over here, and then this final form of it mm, over here. So what I'm gonna do is just write these three forms of the equation on a clean page. So the first form of the governing equation was this form, which is what we started off with. This is the form of the principle of minimum potential energy. And it's a very easy frame of reference for us to derive equations in. Then we saw this form after we had integrated it by parts once, where instead of having a del w comma x x, we had only the first derivative of the variation. And then the final form, which gave us our known governing equation for the system of a cantilevered beam with a distributed load. 
Let's give these some numbers. Uh, 10, I think we're up to 11 and 12. And then this first form I've described as the weak form. We'll talk a little bit more about why that is later. This final form I've referred to as a strong form. And in the past, I've said, well, the strong form is when you have no derivative here on the del W. We'll talk a little bit more later about why that is. And then this second form in the middle, I would call, I guess, is also a weak form. It's an alternate weak form, I call it. We're not going to discuss this form probably at all. It's of no use to us for the purpose of these videos. Now, what is great about the strong form? Well, the strong form is where the exact solution comes from. If you want to find the exact solution to the system, you must use the strong form. On the other hand, most of the time, there don't exist any exact solutions for the sort of systems that we're trying to solve. As a result, we need to come up with approximate solutions. Now, for the purpose of approximate solutions, either the strong form or the weak form may be used. I think it's good at this point to point out a couple of things. First of all, the strong form is the conventional differential equation, as you know it. The weak form is an alternative representation of this differential equation. The strong form imposes higher stringency in terms of its continuity requirements. We'll elaborate on that in a minute. Whereas the weak form relaxes this to some degree because it is a lower order derivative. So it relaxes the requirements on the solution, which means it's easier to find a solution. So whereas the strong form of the governing equation, along with the boundary conditions, states the condition at every point over a domain that a solution must satisfy, by comparison, the weak form states this condition not in a point-by-point -point sense, but more in an integral sense. You can think of it as more of an average sense. And this is very important to note. The weak form does not imply inaccuracy or inferiority versus the strong form. The name strong form is because it puts more stringent requirements on the solution as opposed to the weak form. As a result, all solutions to the strong form will satisfy the weak form of the equations, but not necessarily vice versa. Solutions to the weak form of the problem will not necessarily satisfy the strong form, but then we understand that these are not exact solutions, they're approximate solutions, albeit very close approximate solutions to the exact solution. Now, when dealing with this version of the weak form, you're going to hear certain expressions used like, like symmetric and bilinear. This refers to the fact that from a mathematical context, if we just remove ourselves from the engineering problem and from the principle of minimum potential energy, if we look at this just purely as a mathematics problem, W is a function of X and del W is a different function of X. From a mathematical point of view, I could have just replaced this by G comma X X. Right? And, and, and the reason I'm doing that is just to show you there is a symmetrical nature between the solutions. G comma X X and W comma X X, which are really just dummy variables. I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but fundamentally the symmetric bilinear form is a form that's going to come up a lot. And this is generally the form that we will be using to find approximate solutions. So just to reiterate, the reason this is called the weak form is that in this context of the cantilevered beam with the distributed load, the weak formulation requires a solution that is at least two times differentiable because we're taking the second derivative. Whereas in the case of the strong form, we require a solution that is four times differentiable. This places a much more stringent requirement on the continuity of the solutions. And one more thing, the approximate solutions that we'll be looking for, and, and I'll denote the approximate solution as W tilde. The approximate solution need only satisfy the geometric boundary conditions in the case of the weak form. However, in the strong form, the approximate solution must satisfy all the boundary conditions, a further more stringent requirement on the solution. So the strong form requires solutions that are four times differentiable and satisfy all the boundary conditions, while the weak form only requires solutions that are two times differentiable and need to require only the geometric boundary condition, a much weaker requirement. And it's this notion of a weaker requirement that we're going to use for the formulation of our methods of approximate solutions. We're going to talk more about that later, but I wanted you to have this video as a reference. I'm probably going to refer viewers to this video a lot. So this will serve as a primer for what's to come on approximate solution. 
Now, if some of you are looking at this and saying, hey, you know, this weak form kind of looks like what we were doing in Finite Elements on that playlist you made way back when, that's exactly right. This should look a lot like Finite Elements, but whereas I just presented it with no background back then, as graduate students, I'd expect you to understand why it is that we use the weak form when formulating the finite element method. Okay, and that's going to come out of hopefully this video as well as the videos to follow this. So really all I want you to get out of this video, if nothing more, is that the governing equations can be written in both a strong form and a weak form. For the purpose of finding approximate solutions, the weak form is a better way to go because it puts less stringent requirements on the solutions, on the approximate solutions. Therefore, there are many more solutions that can be used as approximate solutions than in the case of the strong formulation. I hope that all makes sense. If it doesn't, I expect the next couple of videos will iron it all out. That's all I want to say about this one. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something useful in this video. If you did, please will you help me out and hit those like buttons. It really helps other people get to watch the videos as well as putting more videos like this in front of you guys. Or better still, click on the subscribe button below and subscribe to the channel and click on the bell icon to be notified of new video releases. And finally, if you have any comments or opinions to contribute, please use the comments section below. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for watching and I will catch up with you in the next video.